So good afternoon, everyone here in New York, and good day to those online. Uh, Minister of the Environment, Ryan from Ireland, thank you very much for joining us, especially, but all of you, most welcome. Um, my name is Shirley Tarawali. I'm Assistant Director General at ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute, and I'm also Chair of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock. Uh, together with uh, ILRI, and if you want to know more about ILRI, you need an egg. Have a look for that outside. Uh, we uh, are hosting this event with uh, the Nature Conservancy, with HEFA, Livestock Development, Livestock Data for Development, Global Dairy Platform, Environment Defense Fund, and thanks to, to Emerging Ag and to those who provided the hosting here. Thank you all very much for this. I want to mention that I think you're going to get a menti code as I'm making my remarks, perhaps, Michael, are we? A menti so that uh, you can join um, from your phone, from your device, but also to allow those online, I think we've got about 50 something people joining us online um, to participate as well. We just wanted to get a bit of a sense of who do we have participating today. And we're here to explore what I think is becoming, or perhaps it is already, one of the biggest food system transformation conundrums. Can we really put sustainable and livestock in the same mouthful? And if we can, what would that look like? What sort of investments are needed? And what are the incentives? Some say that investing in livestock, particularly in the global south, is risky. At the recent African Food Systems Summit in Kigali, I heard it put a better way, that not investing is even riskier. And that's especially true for the livestock sector, where smart investment could make a difference between a future where sustainable production contributes to good healthy, sustainable diets. It plays a role in ecosystem services and contributes to multiple livelihood dim dimensions for over a billion people. But it will not just happen. And importantly, because of that multiplicity of livestock, different species, cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, poultry, camels, and different commodities, milk, meat, and eggs, and production systems from small backyard one cow operations a few chickens, vast pastures and rangelands, to intensive and efficient commercial units. Huge diversity, which means our sequence of actions, the levers that were just talked about in the previous session, um, and the pathways we must take, the investments that are needed, are all very, very different. Even if we have a similar destination, sustainable, healthy food systems, and we all agree as well that there is a need for change, no matter where you start, towards greater sustainability in all dimensions. It's not an option. In the context, I think, particularly of this event, climate action, it's important to recognize a few things. For livestock in particular, adaptation and mitigation are almost always two sides of the same coin. They go together. Where my organization works across the global south, there are huge opportunities for emission reduction through that combination of improved genetics, feeds, management, and health that have co-benefits with adaptation. In fact, we're a beneficiary of a recent uh, BOMA grant that is really allowing us to delve into some of these areas, as well as taking the lead in convening a wider group of actors around a livestock and climate solutions hub. Watch this space. And there's, of course, lots of opportunities on the adaptation side as well, often with mitigation co-benefits, such as through multifunctional services of livestock-related landscapes. So today, we're going to explore opportunities on the adaptation side with those um, diverse pathways, co-benefits such as um, taking a global expert view here and hearing about solutions that really work across Africa, across Latin America, 
and digging into some of those financing dimensions. During the reception that follows, and please do stay for that networking and engagement part, we'll also have the opportunity to hear about some new material on livestock and climate financing from the Livestock Data for Decisions team. So with that, let me start by inviting our keynote speaker to frame the, the session. Please join me in welcoming Mario Herrero, not a stranger to many of us, who's a professor at Cornell University, Cal's Department of Global Development, and director of Food Systems and Global Change. Mario. I think you have to come here. Thanks a lot, Shirley. Uh, it, is a, it is a real pleasure to be here, uh, sharing some thoughts with you. Uh, let, me, let me get my act together. OK, great. So we have it here. Uh, so what I want to talk about is a, a little bit is, is about sustainable livestock, as Shirley said. What are, the, what are the key challenges that we have? What are the kinds of misconceptions that, that I keep on listening, you know, that I've kept on listening for the last couple of decades, and uh, and also to posit some solutions for you, and some solutions for you. Yeah. Okay, great. So Shirley told me that it was going to happen by pressing the green button, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, the first thing I want to say is that we're dealing with an enormous sector, and this is actually part of what the challenge is about. You know, we're talking about $3.5 trillion invested in livestock in terms of animals and the products. Uh, if you compare it to crops, uh, that's about an extra trillion dollars, and that's all the crops of the world. So there's a lot, a lot of uh, okay, this this disappeared. Michael. Hmm. Okay, great. Okay, okay great. Uh, and you know, there's about a, a billion people employed in sometimes very long value chains. This is not an insignificant amount of money. And one of the key things that we need to understand is that livestock. You know, many of the enterprises are very profitable. That's one of the reasons why it's also very, very difficult for people to, uh, well, not, not to engage in the sector. Next slide, please. On top of that, we have, if, if you look at what's happening around the world, we have a, a burgeoning population. We know that uh, as people get richer, they consume uh, more animal products, and but we really have three stories, three storylines of per capita demand here. One that is around the monogastrics, pork and poultry especially, which are growing at an accelerated pace everywhere, where we actually have rates of growth of higher than higher than five percent per year in many countries, way above the population growth growth rates. Um, and particularly in low and middle income countries. Dairy, which is actually growing a lot in low and middle income countries, I think that it's a very, it's a success story in many parts of, of the world as, a, as an example of sustainable intensification. It's stagnating a bit in terms of, of demand per capita in the OECD. And then we have red meats that in reality on a per capita basis have stayed constant for the last 15, 20 years. They're even decreasing in OECD countries, the rates of animal product consumption. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, I show this slide, uh, and you know, many of you might not, might not agree with a neat Lancet diet. And I really don't put it just to, just to look at the numbers, whether it's 14 grams or 18 grams, but to show you that if, even if they eat Lancet, would have actually missed this by, you know, 200%. 
there are still places that are over-consuming, uh, uh, especially red meats, you know? While other places, well, obviously, we really need to continue the provision of animal source foods for the nourishment, uh, you know, of small kids, women, etc. I don't think that the Eat Lancet report would have missed this by, you know, by, by three times. But, you know, this really shows the real diversity of uh, situations that we have in the world. We have a global mitigation agenda, but in, on, on one hand, you know, you have places that are really over-consuming animal products, other places that are, that are not doing so. And obviously, the strategies, the values that uh, the livestock sector will bring will be completely different in, in those. And we need to take this into consideration when designing the solutions for the livestock sector. Next slide, please. Yeah, and then we get to emissions, enormous emissions. These are 60% these are of the emissions of the food system are generated by the livestock sector. And in reality, when you look at some of these numbers, you find out that 65 to 78% uh, are produced, are emitted by cattle. 45% of this is enteric methane, and 40% is basically land use change in food production. The main source is the CO2, and while there is a lot of focus on the methane, we should not lose track of land use and land use change. Ultimately, it's a land use problem, what we have here, and we need to, we, we need to make a lot of choices. 60% of the greenhouse gases come from mixed crop livestock systems. A lot of these are in, in, in the smallholder sector in low and middle income countries. So this is where really the, the potential big wins are. And also just to say, just to continue with the topic of how big the sector is, we're using one third of the global cropland to produce feed for livestock. And if you go by what the projections say, you know, by 2050, we will be using the same amount of grains to feed livestock than to feed humans. So that's one of the things that we need to, we need to actually start thinking about. Plus the three and a half billion hectares of grasslands that also a cattle ruminants utilize. Next slide, please. Yeah, I'll keep it up. One of, one of the key observations that we, need to, that we need to make about the livestock sector, if you look at the last 15 years, cattle numbers, the growth in the herd, the numbers of animals are still driving the increases in production in the majority of the places. If you look at that global, uh, uh, the, the first line, the global numbers, production in the last decade and a half increased by 27%, of which yield increases for 13% and the number of animals grow. So, you know, we reduced effectively emissions intensity. That's what increasing the yields caused. But we did not contribute to a net mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. So if the livestock sector by today's standards were, was asked to uh, have the same levels of reductions as other sectors, we would still need a lot to do. This did happen in some places. If you look at the high-income countries, we, you know, huge increases in yield still, but with animal numbers being a really important source of, of, achieve, of achieving that net mitigation goal. And if you actually move, say, to, to parts like Sub-Saharan Africa at the bottom, you will see that, yeah, production also increased a lot, but it was all mediated by increases in animal numbers. And so what does that tell you? What should we do? We perhaps should, uh, should actually try to implement sustainable intensification solutions that go hand in hand with reductions in the numbers of animals. And this is a lot easier to do it in the dairy sector because you can more easily decouple a, you know, the, pro the production productivity relation that, than you can in, a, in the beef sector. Next slide, please. Yeah, and there's some, there's some really uh, 
good examples of places that are on the right trajectory. The, the, the red square that you see there is where we want to be. You know, fewer animals, more, more production. We have about 32% of the global dairy production in this situation. So what Donald and colleagues are, are trying to do is to move the country to, towards that left upper, upper corner that we want, because then we're really contributing to the climate mitigation goals as, as expected. It's not only the reductions in emissions intensity, which is not enough. Ne next slide, please. I have two more slides. Just a quick note on methane and metrics, because this is actually something that comes uh, all the time. And a lot of people say, well, why, why worry about methane? Methane is so short-lived. Uh, well, yeah, it is a pulse, as you can see it. But it, as long as the animal's alive, that pulse will also happen tomorrow and, to, uh, and the day after and the day after. And it creates a, a small cumulative cur curve, as you see in the, in the, in the left side of of the panel in the, in the lower. Now, but what's the reality? That animal numbers are increasing. So it doesn't matter that, that methane has a, a shorter uh, lifespan or, or anything when animal numbers are increasing. Emissions of methane are simply going up and we need to, to sort that. Michael, next slide, please. I don't want to take a lot of the time. <laughs> You know, this is a little bit of a complicated diagram, but all I want to say here, and this is at, at the core of what we're trying to discuss here, trying. There's, hmm? there's a lot, a lot of practices, some of which we have already used, that deal from land use practices, how to deal with enteric fermentation, carbon sequestration, you name it, you name it. And we know, we've quantified in the past that you know, technical potential is about 2.4 gigaton livestock. But we're only realizing about 0.4 gigatons from, a, from an economic potential. It's simply not feasible yet. The, the economic conditions are not there for a massive adoption. And this is, I'm not dealing with vaccines and things like that. These are actually feeding better the animals and, and simple practices that, that are still we're not penetrating with high adoption rates. We, we, we always thought, well, you know, in 15 years you get a decent rate of adoption is about 20% in 15 years. So can you imagine when we're talking about trying to get things done by 2050, then, then what are we talking about? How are we going to really penetrate the markets for, uh, for achieving the kinds of big environmental goals that we want? Next slide. And then, you know, then, of course, we, we keep on, we're fantastic at generating technologies, you know. We keep on doing so and, and putting more in the arsenal. And there's, you know, uh, methane inhibitors, vaccines, low emissions breeding, seaweed, all, all of them. And you've probably heard already about these. Yes, they have a great technical potential, but, you know, the economic potential, how are we going to ensure that this gets deployed? at scale, and in which systems, and how, and under which, uh, on, under which circumstances. I was just having a chat with Shirley about, you know, you're, you're a dairy farmer. You, you need these things to be in the market every single day. So you need to really start thinking about supply chains. How, how are we going to do this to get to de-risk all the, the use of these different practices, you know? It's very, very difficult in a low and middle income situation. Yeah, next slide. Mm -hmm. And then we also talked about, you know, the impacts of climate change and adaptation. And this is uh, just to give you a very quick idea of, you know, it's very complex. There's a lot of ways in which climate change will affect livestock. Some of these pathways are more prominent in some systems than others. Trying to do mitigation while we're trying to adapt, while we get production losses, probably while prices are actually increasing. Well, costs are actually increasing. 
due to losses of production and a range of other things. So let's keep that in mind for the future, because I think that we, we rarely, when we're talking about mitigation, we tend to focus just on the methane, uh, on the CO2, and, and this, is, this adds to the complexity significantly. Michael? <coughs> then some novel options. Circularity. We really need to think what we're going to do with food waste seriously. And, you know, we can, we can produce microbial protein through fermentation processes. That, that sounds like a great idea. Um, I think that it has, it's more promising for the livestock sector than as a, than as a food for, for people. And you already have some companies exploiting this production of mi microbial protein. It produces a, a, a powder like, like casein, and it gets incorporated in rations of uh, pigs and poultry in, instead of uh, soybeans. So, you know, that, that generates a really important effect. So we're talking about 35% of human protein requirements that we could actually meet uh, by using circular uh, feed systems. It's worth investigating. I think that that chunk is, is big enough to, to give it a little bit of, of, of uh, you know, of, of, for testing. Next slide, Michael, please. <clears throat> yeah, then, as we said, alternative protein sources, 11 to 19 percent is, by our estimates, uh, the, the level of replacement that we will be able to achieve. We've done these studies with colleagues at Wageningen, and it's, it's actually quite significant that we could reduce feed pro, greenhouse gases from feed production by 8%. Next slide, Michael. But, you know, relative to, to the trillions of dollars that I spoke about that the livestock sector uh, will uh, is, is worth, you know, it's, it's still well, the penetration of alternative proteins won't be uh, so large, you know, at least to 2050. So we really need more convincing examples of these. Have, you know, I'm sure that you've all tried some of these. And, you know, the taste profiles are still, uh, let's say, questionable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I, um, next slide, Mike. So just very quickly to finalize here, you know, the, the solutions, the, the positive note is that there's a lot of options. There's, they are all already out there. What we need to really is to deal with the low adoption of the improved practices. There are still things that are relatively easy from a technical perspective that are not getting adopted. And this is where we really need to focus uh, you know, and in, in many of, of the cases, it's what I call naive economics, you know. It's really not working out how this is going to be deployed at scale. What are the true costs of deploying these technologies? What are going to be the transition costs? You know, if farmers have to increase manage the managerial capacity, if they have to do, you know, all sorts of gymnastics to have to adopt these practices, it really becomes very difficult for them to be interested in something. The common denominator needs to be that it needs to fit within their management system. And you know, we need to really think of m more people trying to see how this is actually going to work, more roadmaps, more who needs to, in to, be, to be involved, etc. We're great at providing solutions. They're usually anonymous solutions. But we need to really start engaging with the stakeholders private industry, you know, what's going to be the role of the government, et cetera. And obviously, if, if you look at, at the values that we're talking about, we real, really need increases in investment, probably of an order of magnitude for them to really achieve the scale that we need. So these are just a few thoughts for, for getting you thinking. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mario, as usual. Lots of facts and figures and provocative and hopefully sets the stage. As I said, we'll have two panels, one looking at solutions and one exploring the financing angle. 
Uh, and I'm really pleased that we have Gerson Fritas with us from Bloomberg uh, News, and he's going to moderate both of the panels. So over to you. Um, hello, everybody. I'd um, like to thank Alive for Climate for having me here. Uh, my name is Gerson Freitas Jr. I'm a Bloomberg News reporter covering agriculture and everything in the commodity world. I am honored to participate in this important discussion with such distinguished guests and experts um, as we explore the role of um, livestock systems in addressing climate change. With uh, no further ado, I'd like to invite first session guests to the stage. Uh, please come take your seats. Uh, Global Dairy Consultant uh, Jay Wadvogel. Um, Carlos, Carlos Tabora, uh, he's project manager of sustainable livestock programs at Heifer International in Honduras. Cleo Kangan, um, head of climate and forests of Bird at BirdLife International. And Perry Hosenstein, Senior Scientist of Livestock Systems at Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you all. Let me join you here. Thank you all. Um, this first session is really focused on some of the opportunities around livestock production systems and understanding how the sector is changing to address climate change, food, and environmental-related challenges. Um, I'd like to start with Jay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the Global Dairy Platform and the key goals of the Dairy Nourishes Africa initiative? Uh, you know, how does it aim to transform dairy sector in East Africa? And crucially, why the focus on East Africa? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, fair warning, if I fully answered your question, we'd be here till sometime tomorrow. So we'll, <laughs> we'll try to hit the high points. Uh, Global Dairy Platform is an organization made up of the largest dairy companies in the world, focused on issues that we can solve better together globally, simply too big or too complex to solve as individual companies or even as regions. And one of those programs we looked at about five years ago, pre-COVID, was how do we show demonstrably the positive impact that dairy can have on all of the vectors, on nutrition, on social, on, on climate, um, and pick a place where it's most important, with an understanding even then that sustainability is an equation. It has a numerator and it has a denominator. And we were spending so much time talking about the denominator, we sometimes forget the positive, the numerator, what's delivered from the system, what's delivered from what you take out. And again, I won't repeat, um, I think we all understand and appreciate what dairy brings. And I was especially heartened to see that the Gates Foundation came out with some, uh, some comments recently, reinforcing that positive impact. So we set about trying to find some place where we could prove that positive first, the power of the numerator. And we chose East Africa for a number of reasons. They need nutrition, they need food. The stunting, wasting, malnutrition numbers are high growing populations of young people who need all those social economic benefits you get from a complex system like dairy. And in going through the process, we found really quickly that you can positively inflect, in fact, the denominator as well. The good you get by improving how you run your dairy system delivers at the same time a reduction in that intensity, delivers a benefit on the denominator. And we've been executing that for about five years now. Um, the one really obvious thing that comes out is it's really, really, really hard. Um, it's really hard to change systems. It's really hard to change behaviors. Um, and I could spend a lot of time on the process that we're trying to do, but uh, I hope you come back with a good question and I'll pass on to the next one. Definitely. Thank you. Carlos, um, what are some of the key challenges faced by you know, smallholder farmers in Honduras when it comes to sustainable livestock production? and? How is Heifer International helping them overcome these challenges? Thank you, Gerson. It's a honor to be here. And before giving an answer, I want to give a little bit of context about um, the livestock sector in Honduras. Honduras is a country who has uh, 96,000 
farmers, livestock farmers, yes. And the 90% of uh, these uh, farmers own fewer than 50 animals and fewer than 50 hectares of land, yes. And some other important information is that nine, two, I'm sorry, 2.9 hectares of land are used for livestock systems. So, and that represents a third of the national territory. Yeah. So that information was a key information to the design of this program. We are currently working in a 10 year program and we are supporting these farmers to have, um, to improve, sorry, to improve uh, the land use. Yeah. But to talk about the challenges, there are some resource limitations. I can say that the, there, there is like a, a difficult to access to water, difficult to ac difficulties to access to uh, feed, and also to veterinary services. Yes. And uh, that limits uh, productivity. Yeah. And we want that our farmers have uh, more productive animals, right? And uh, more healthy, healthier animals that can be more productive, sorry. So um, another problem can be like market barriers that they can have, yes. And what Heifer is uh, doing is um, developing programs like milk aggregation to connect farmers to larger markets, yes. And also to deal with uh, some um, land degradation problems, what we are doing is that we are promoting sustainable practices um, and we are teaching them holistic, um, holistic um, techniques like rotational grazing, yeah? And that is how they are, uh, we are having healthier soil, right? And because of that, we are also having um, better pastures and also healthier animals. When you talk about connecting to larger markets, you mean international markets? Yeah, Central America mainly, okay. yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Cleo, um, why is BirdLife International, whose mission is to protect birds, interested in livestock production and you know, how it's seeking to integrate uh, you know, livestock with uh, Nature Conservancy? Yeah, uh, great question. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with BirdLife International, can you hear me okay? Uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's a partnership of 123 uh, national conservation organizations around the world. And our mission, as you say, is to uh, protect birds and, and nature. Um, BirdLife partners work in a large number of grassland and livestock um, projects around the world, but today I'm really um, going to share the experience on behalf of the four bird life partners uh, down in the southern cone of Latin America in the Pampas grasslands, and I've got colleagues who are online. So this is the partners in Argentina, in Brazil, Paraguay, uh, and Uruguay. So why, why is bird life, you know, why is bird life interest in, the, in this? These uh, southern cone Pampas grasslands are incredibly important for biodiversity. Uh, they are home to 96 key biodiversity areas, so these are sites of global biodiversity importance. Uh, they're home to 550 species of bird that are dependent on these grasslands. Um, they're also 95% uh, privately owned, and these grasslands are also home to an internationally renowned uh, grass-fed beef uh, that's really part also of the, uh, of the um, Southern Cone sort of national identities. Um, so you can see why, you know, the, the shared interest between sort of the cattle ranchers down in the Southern Cone grasslands and, and bird life. The, the primary threat to these grasslands is conversion of these grasslands uh, to soybean crops uh, and also to afforestation of non-native tree species, especially eucalyptus. Um, so bird life uh, over the last 18 years, back in 2006, uh, recognizing these threats, the grasslands and our shared interest with cattle ranchers, we, uh, or the four bird life partners, established um, what's called the Alianza de Pastizal, the Southern Cone Grassland Alliance. And over the last 18 years, we've really been working hand in hand with ranchers to try and keep ranchers ranching. And Perry. Um we all in this room know that you know, livestock production is a major contributor to climate change through emissions of methane from 
from menu and uh, gastroenteric releases. Uh, this is your area of expertise. Uh, what is the potential for reducing or mitigating planet warming emissions from livestock, livestock sector, particularly uh, the methane emissions? First of all, thank you for having me on the panel. And thank you for the question. Um, I certainly think there's great potential. I think that's why many of us are here in this room, because there is great potential. I think we have to first acknowledge that these reductions are critical. Um, rapidly and significantly reducing methane emissions is the most effective way to reduce the rate of warming in general and in the, especially in the near term over the next few decades. And the faster we act, the sooner we see these climate benefits. Over 150 countries have joined the Global Methane Pledge, and that's a commitment to reduce their methane emissions by 30% um, by 2030. Um, compared to 2020. And while the Global Methane Pledge is agriculture and energy, agriculture will certainly need to be a big part of that. Agriculture accounts for about 40% of methane, of anthropogenic methane emissions, so human-caused methane emissions globally, with livestock accounting for about 30% of that. And that's enteric and manure methane, as you were mentioning. And we, like Mario was saying, we have a lot of strategies that already exist that can reduce um, the methane emissions from both of those categories. And so it's working on getting those adopted, financed, and, and many of the other areas that Mario already covered. And then innovation. I mean, we have some exciting developments in the feed additive space and vaccines. Um, we acknowledge the limitations that they'll work in certain systems and not others, and so we need more innovation and more um, exploration of strategies, but I think the potential is big, and I appreciate all the conversations we're having to, to move that forward. Is there a number? Uh, is there a number we can put on in terms of how much um, those emissions can be reduced potentially or realistically uh, speaking? I've seen a lot of different numbers, um, and I certainly have my own. I think looking at what the Global Methane Pledge is committing, um, I think that's a good place to start. Again, that's energy and ag. Um, so, so uh, I, I'm hesitant to, to commit to a number. I'd like to be optimistic and ambitious, okay. and I think that's a good place to be. Okay. Awesome. Jay, you, you were talking earlier about uh, the difficulties, and uh, I'd like you to, to explore a little bit of that, and uh, and also how is addressing you know the need uh, to reduce the impact of livestock uh, production on climate is different in countries like you know Tanzania uh, from places like California or Brazil or Netherlands. Uh, what what kind of specific difficulty you see? in East Africa compared to those countries? Yeah, so first the context, I think it's repeating some things we've heard before, but roughly 20% of the emissions that come from the dairy sector are in developed countries, are in Europe, are in the US, uh, for example. And I have every belief that there are enough tools in place that you can imagine that being net zero at some point, right? There's gonna be required investment, required revenue sources, but you can see that happening, right? We've already talked about the relative slowdown in the consumption, you continue to see efficiencies. Imagine that it gets to zero. Just take that leap of faith it can get to zero. 80% comes from these developing markets, which have high intensity rates, which have growing populations, which are undernourished dramatically, which need more food. If you believe there's a problem, you need to be there. That's where the problem is going to grow. And the beauty of it is that if you look at the solutions, which have been outlined by the dairy sector in a program called Pathway to Dairy Net Zero, which looks across different farming models, different geographies, different scales, and says, what are the tools that you can use to get to a net zero? The first almost 40% of reduction, even in countries like the US, is really no regrets. Better genetics, better feeding, better manure management programs, things that give the farmer a financial benefit. There's another 30 or 40% that requires some source of revenue. Can I get paid enough to put in a manure digester? Can I get rewarded for cover crops, et cetera? And there's another maybe 30% that's over the rainbow, but no reason to believe we won't get there with CRISPR technology, immunization programs. But right now, that 40% that sits there can be implemented across the developing market today to some extent. And once you put those tools in place and you start to evolve from one cow, two cow farmers, which is great, people support them, but if you can get professional farmers, in Tanzania, to use an example, a five cow farmer is middle class, he can send his kids to school, he can hire people, but he also has his skills and tools that you can start to put what already exists as solutions into their farming practices. 
that woman farmer can now reduce her intensity, reduce her emissions, and increase the positive benefit that livestock, that dairy brings. So the pathway there is really obvious, and in practice, really simple, and implementation, really hard. It's education, it's commitment, it's understanding the whole chain. Right? If you just go in historically and say, I'm going to give someone a cow, it's fantastic. Fantastic. If they don't have a place to sell the milk, the cow doesn't last too long. If you go somewhere and give a kid a glass of milk, fantastic. When the grant is gone, there's no more milk. If you get the whole chain working, which is what we do with Dairy Nourishes Africa, you now create a system that you can add more and more tools into and more and more improvement. So that, for me, is, is reasonably clear. The really, really hard part is how do you pay for it? Which is why I'm really glad we have a second panel to answer that yeah. one for us. <laughs> Absolutely. But if I can make, if I can make a follow-up question, so where to start from? I mean, you say the pathway is clear. There's a, several tools available. So, so if you look at how we're doing it in Tanzania, as an example, we we have a program working together with uh, our friends and partners at Bain that describes what they call the farmer allied intermediary model, which says I can't just work with the farmer. I can't just work with the consumer. I need to work with them and the processor in the middle. So how do you line them all up? How do you understand how, in order to get better productivity, I need a good feed source. I need veterinary supply sources. I need a processor who can actually turn the product into a sellable product. I need consumers who understand the value and governments who set policy in place to do it. So all that's laid out. And then you can implement over the top of that all these tools, whether it's better genetics, whether it's better crop management that actually work. But a huge, huge part of that is education. Okay. Right? Awesome. Um, Carlos, how does Half International ensure that sustainable livestock programs are inclusive and benefit women and marginalized groups in rural communities? Okay, that's a really important question because Heifer. Um, um, promotes the inclusion yeah, of women in marginalized groups. And in the program, targets at least the 30% of women's participation. Yeah? And how we do that, we promote them to participate in cooperatives and having um, leadership uh, roles in them, right? And we also train them in um, specific livestock management, and also we have a promoters program where we include uh, these groups, right? And we give a special training and certification, right? So they can continue teaching and replicating the knowledge that they receive in their communities. Um, Leo, how does how does uh, BirdLife International ensure that the sustainable practices uh, promoted among livestock producers are economically viable and you know, beneficial for the producers themselves? I think it's a key element. Right, so, yeah, so as I was saying earlier, the, um, right at the heart of the Alianza del Pastizal is the motivation to support uh, sort of the economic, in, enhancing the economic viability of, these, of the cattle ranch and going in the pastures grassing. So that's so economic viability is really sort of our, our lodestar in what's driving what we're doing. Um, the, there are four main sort of we've, we, over the years we've tried you know a, many different approaches uh, around this, and I think there are sort of four main ones that we're we're using. The first one is around um, supporting the ranchers to or training and supporting the ranchers to take up uh, sustainable grazing practices that we heard about in Honduras. So typically this is sort of rotation, rotational grazing management, water management. Uh, with benefits for the ranchers around increased grass productivity, increased drought resilience, benefits for biodiversity because it in, in, um, varies the grass height, more uh, native grass species, and also the drought resilience benefits for the climate because of enhanced soil organic carbon sequestration. So that's one strand of work that's probably the, the main, the, the most important. We also have strands of work around supporting ranchers and their families to develop um, alternative or sort of side-by-side -side income streams like honey and uh, wine and olive oil. Uh, we created a Grassland Alliance certified beef back in 2010 and have been working to try and market um, this really high value grass-fed beef um, into, into export markets. And lastly, we have, in Argentina, the BirdLife Partner has been developing a grass and carbon project, uh, which is uh, you know, 
well along on its way of implementation and um, credits hopefully issued next year. So yeah, multiple streams, but uh, yeah, this is really economic sustainability is the core and, and we're both pulling together on, on this issue. And uh, Perry, what's the most, what's the most promising uh, strategies for reducing uh, methane emissions from livestock. Uh, if you uh, look at them all, which one is uh, is the one that should be investing the most, and how we can uh, scale them up? Yeah, so there are many opportunities, and it really depends on region, production system, the different contexts, and so it's hard to pick just one. And I tend to put them in two categories, and it's it's come up in the discussion before a category of optimizing productivity, um, and that can be done through strategies to improve animal health, animal nutrition, um, reproduction, adaptation and resilience. Um, as Shirley said, it's two sides of the same coin. Um, and those areas give you climate mitigation over time through um, compared to business as usual growth. And that's really important in light of a growing world population, growing demand for animal source foods. So I think those are really critical. Um, they give us the triple wins that we talk about, which I've learned there's much debate about what the triple is and triple wins, but I like to say animals, humans, and the environment. Um, and for humans, you get um, improved nutrition, improved livelihoods, improved health, food security. Um, so I think those are really, really important areas and really um, valuable contributions. Then on the other side, you have absolute methane emissions reduction through oftentimes through innovations like the feed additives and the vaccines we've talked about. Two that get me particularly excited, I would say, would be animal health and genetics. Um, those can touch on both of those areas. Um, they can have improvements for um, productivity, optimizing productivity, and also give you some absolute methane emissions reductions. Both of them um, are key in that way, I think, and, and can apply to many different settings. And in terms of scale, oh, sorry, do you want me to no, answer no, no. the scaling part? Um, in terms of how you scale those, it's a lot of what we've talked about before, which is continuing to draw attention to the issues, education, um, working on the measurement. If you need to be able to measure um, the impacts, measure the problem, um, and the on-ground logistics. So whether that's access to um, veterinary products or um, technical services, veterinary services, which have come up before, those are all critical to actually deploying them on the ground. And then financing is always going to be that ongoing question. And again, looking forward to panel two. Okay, sounds good. I think we're running out of time, but I'd like to make you a last question uh, for each, each one of you to answer in 20 seconds or so. But what are the low hanging fruits of sustainable livestock production? The ones that we should be targeting right away because it's easy to get done if, if there is such a thing. Yeah, there's lots of logging through. The one comment I'll make before I preface that is a reminder that there are billions of people in the world today who still live transactional day-to-day -day lives, right? It's, it's people who are malnourished, stunted, working every day for how they pay for that day. They are never going to buy into your long-term problem if they don't have their own long-term future. So anything you do has to give them a sense of they have a future that they need to invest in. And the low-hanging fruit from livestock for agriculture to me is just investing in the education and knowledge for those people to take the existing no regrets things. It's not even the complexity of genetics. It's give your cow fresh water. It's feed your cow a little bit better. It's take care of the healthier cow. Those things are right on the table for us today. Invest your time in those. You'll get huge returns immediately and build a platform to then go further and further and further. For me, I think that it's uh, spreading the, the word uh, of regenerative uh, agriculture, right? Because I think it's really crucial um, for vulnerable communities, right? To know that now that if we implement this with them, um, it's going to be a way to enhance the health of the land and the animals and also the people. Yeah, and I think in the pampas grasslands, it's a, it's a similar message. I think the low-hanging fruit is that um, through implementing sustainable grazing techniques, you can really get wins for the people, for the communities, for biodiversity, and for climate. And so the limiting factor is, you know, boots on the ground to actually work and support the ranchers to uh, implement these te techniques. I'll echo what prior panelists have said about existing solutions that we can uh, employ now, and, and they're the basics. I would agree that there's a lot that we can do 
outcome that doesn't require a lot of the sometimes exciting and, and eye-catching innovation. We can stick with some of what we already know how to do and just make sure it reaches the people who need it. Awesome. I don't know if you have any questions from the audience. Well, I, I think there is a microphone circulating somewhere. And there's a, after this one, uh, Gerson, there's one or two on the, uh, from online as well, which I can ask. Thanks. I'd like to point out that the panelists here are paid by multinational corporations whose uh, ambitions are to raise profits and not protect the climate. I'm a scientist, and I know that reputable science says that these so-called sustainable solutions are not scalable. And we know today that the expansion of animal agriculture is responsible for over 70% of global deforestation. So expansion of animal agriculture into different countries and in, around the world is going to, regardless of the emissions intensity, is going to increase the climate crisis, is going to increase deforestation and our biodiversity crisis. So I'd like to just call this out as greenwashing. Thank you, next one. I have a, a question from the uh, uh, from online, and it's for Jay. And uh, what is the role of your agency in tackling the challenge of sustainability in the dairy value chain, especially with the small smallholder dairy farmers? So the Global Dairy Platform um, has laid out a program called Pathways to Dairy Net Zero. Participates in Global Methane Hub, other places. That says, what can we do collectively that we couldn't do as individual companies, individual countries, regions that are big enough we can get our heads around. And that's everything from supporting technology for the new science. That's everything from supporting implementation of existing tools, working hard to blend into the finance conversation later about how we can actually get carbon credit systems or other systems to help fund some of this work. And it is directly in the work of what I talked about with Dairy Nourishes Africa about putting those expertises, that knowledge on the ground to help the smallest of smallholder farmers. And it's not just in East Africa, it's 10 different countries around the world working with Green Climate Fund on a major program to actually find out how we get the boots on the ground, how we get the basic knowledge to people. So it's everything and anything. That's it. Okay, so. Hi, I'm Caitlin from the Changing Markets Foundation, and we work to try and shift corporates away from unsustainable practices to more sustainable ones. And um, we recently published a report called The New Merchants of Doubt, which looks into the tactics of big meat and dairy companies to distract, delay, and derail climate action. And um, I think some of these solutions, there are some that we have to do. Sure, we need technical solutions, but we also need a reduction in livestock numbers. And experts agree we need to make that happen in high and middle income countries by 2025. And we saw in the presentation at the beginning just how significant overconsumption is in lots of parts of the world. And this remains a really taboo subject to talk about. And I haven't heard it spoken about really at all throughout Climate Week this week. So I'd love to hear from the panel how you think we can depolarize this topic and start talking about the reduction of consumption that we need as well as the technical solutions. I want to take this one. I'll give it a brief shot. Um, I do think if you look at the livestock sector in general, look at dairy in particular, look at the number of dairy cattle today versus 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, dramatic reduction. Right? The number of cows is dramatically less than it used to be. So you see those things in practice. How do you employ those in developing markets where they simply need the food is a harder question we're trying to address. In terms of consumption, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the, the fundamental problem for me, so I'll speak a bit more personally, in the US, I had this conversation with this morning, sitting in the window, eating breakfast, looking out, right? We waste 40% of our food. We probably overconsume 30%. Look at the solution there. It's nothing to do with reducing cow numbers. It's everything to do with reducing the waste of food that we have, reducing the overconsumption of food that we have, to get a better distribution of it. So if you want to find really easy solutions, I agree there are other ones. Um, I don't think it's an easy solution to tell people who need food in places they don't have food that they should just produce less food. No one else? Okay. There's another one. Hey, my name is Amber Smith, and I'm a cattle rancher. And hearing that we should depolarize the topic, 
Um, and then hearing that this is greenwashing because you all work in multinational corporations. I would actually love to repolarize the topic and have a room, have half of this room be of people from around the globe who are caring for animals, caring for their families, caring for their community, so that we can have a conversation where we're looking at real people. Um, you know, when we're talking about profitability and asking people to decrease the numbers of livestock, the people who are able to increase are often increasing trying to break even and become profitable. So um, I think the conversation is nuanced and when you are boots on the ground working in community, I just want to applaud you for that effort because it's important and valuable. And um, you, you being able to see the practices people are doing the very best they can with, knowing they can do better and providing tools for them to do better is very valuable work. So thank you for the ways in which you're doing that. Wrap this up. So thank you, Jay, Carlos, Cleo, Perry. Uh, we're going to move on to our next session. Our uh, next session is a bit of a harder talk focused on how livestock needs to change and what investments are necessary to make the transition to sustainable livestock systems, and more importantly, how do we fund it? Uh, I'd like to invite to the stage William Sutton, uh, Global Lead for Climate Smart Agriculture and Leader Agro Agricultural Com Economist at the World Bank. Uh, Jeanette Gurin, uh, Executive Director at Women Organizing for Change in Agriculture and Natural Resource Management, and a member of the LEAD uh, Solutions Group. Um, Charles Brook, um, Program Lead of Enteric Methane at Spark Climate Solutions. And Michael Wyronen, Director of Corporate Engagement for Food and Water at Nature Conservancy. So uh, I'd like to start with an honest and a little bit of a provoking question for all of you. Uh, it's clear that livestock production has some severe negative impacts on the environment. We're talking about greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. We're talking about uh, land degradation, animal welfare issues, and uh, this has been uh, 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 raised by, by the audience. Why should we look to invest and support uh, more sustainable livestock production and you know, investing in mitigating the problem instead of just moving away from it? Do you, do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> start with me, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the invitation to represent the World Bank here. Um, I mean, it's a good question. I, I think, you know, there's no simple answer. What I would say is I don't think there's any one-size-fits-all answer, and I, I think that's really important. Um, at the World Bank, we recently came out with our first ever global flagship report on uh, climate change mitigation in the global agri-food system. It's called Recipe for a Livable Planet achieving net zero emissions in the agri-food system. And one thing we do is carry out the analysis and develop recommendations by country income categories. So looking at high income countries, um, low income countries, but also a third category that people uh, often uh, neglect to mention, which is the middle income countries, which is actually where the, the majority of agri-food emissions are coming from. And so we, we develop um, uh, recommendations for each of the different country income types. And, um, you know, I, I think certainly w what we say is that particularly in high and middle income countries, you know, dietary shifts are one of the most cost effective ways to uh, re reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other negative environmental externalities from livestock production. That, um, and, and, and it doesn't mean that people, you know, necessarily have to stop eating meat. 
uh, even shifting, for example, from consuming beef to consuming uh, pork, chicken, would significantly reduce the, uh, the, the emissions footprint of diets. But of course, shifting to plant-based proteins would reduce them significantly more. But we're not in the business of, of telling people what they shouldn't, shouldn't eat. Um, so what we say is that, I mean, if you look at, the, today there's a m massive amount of money that's spent globally on subsidizing agriculture and other types of public supports for agriculture, over $600 billion a year. About a third of that goes to supporting subsidizing meat and dairy production. So what we say is that, you know, let's let the, the prices of meat and dairy products reflect their true cost. Um, the, the true cost uh, in terms of impacts on the climate, in terms of impacts on nature, in terms of impacts on health. And if we did so, the, the prices would be about 20 to 60 percent higher than what they are today. Um, and that would obviously make, uh, n you know, non-meat agricultural products significantly more competitive. And I, I think that's an important part of the process. If we, if we did that in the, the high and middle income countries where most of the, the subsidies are, are being provided, that, that would shift diets, reduce consumption of the high and medium livestock products, and it would actually allow um, lower income countries to potentially increase their production of livestock to provide important nutrition for their populations without increasing the, the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions from livestock. A little bit of a rebound. Exactly, yeah. Thanks for the easy question. Um, we have a different focus, right? I mean, I work with women, women's organizations, women's groups around the world, primarily in the global south. So for us, livestock management from a woman farmer's perspective, and let's remember women are the farmers of the world. We forget, we think of a man, but you know, it's primarily women who are farming the world. And for them, livestock is very often just a part of the holistic system of, of managing landscape, water resources, forestry resources, grassland resources, and, and in, it kind of comes to the point of often managing livestock. For women, it's often not the cattle or the dairy cattle or the ranch cattle, it's often the chickens. So let's not forget that livestock is, 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 is a different. And for women, I think livestock has a particular um, importance because it's often one of the only things they may own, right? They're not often gonna own the land. So when women need money for school fees or something like this, and you have a chicken, you sell a chicken, and that's how you keep the family going. So I think the way we think of livestock is often in a more self-sufficiency, food security um, purpose, and less, not to say that women aren't also entrepreneurs and managing large ranches and things like this, but much of the world is managing livestock in a very small scale. All right, so I, I focus largely on ruminant animals. So uh, as far as livestock are, are concerned, um, ruminant animals play a very unique role in the ecosystem. They eat food that many other animals cannot eat, and they're able to convert that into food that we can eat. And that is simply a mechanism that we don't see a lot in the other, the other livestock systems. And they are, there is a core benefit to that. It increases our access to calories, which we wouldn't otherwise have. And we have modified that through our production system to maximize gain um, from these animals as well. Um, and so I think, that as other uh, panelists have mentioned, it's important that we do reflect uh, the cost of, of production systems in the, the true cost of uh, a product. But it's also an opportunity to, for that, that cost to be reflected in the positive impacts that uh, a, pro a practice can have in some of these systems as well. And that's something that we don't do a great job of, of, of tracking. So there is room to de decrease demand in the higher income systems. There's definitely a need to increase uh, supply in some of these, these lower income systems as well. Um, but overall, at the end of the day, when we look towards 2050, we look towards 2100, we have to ask ourselves is, are ruminants gonna be part of the human food supply? Is there going, are there going to be enteric emissions there to abate? And how much are they gonna be contributing to 
the, the overall budget. And if that's not zero, and if it's still significant as it is today, then we're, we would do ourselves a disservice into writing off the development of these solutions and the deployment of these solutions. And so we need to be taking a portfolio approach to our management and our investments of global warming that can include demand, um, and it needs to include direct solution development and partnership. It's on? Perfect. So I'm not going to repeat what everyone else has said, and we got some great framing from uh, Dr. Herrero at the beginning looking at you know, both the opportunity for dietary shifts that the Lancet report has exposed, as well as uh, the need in some places to increase uh, animal protein. I will say, though, that from our perspective, um, we see opportunities for innovation at multiple levels in the system, at the individual ranch. I think to your point, Charles, uh, ruminants are actually have always been part of our ecosystems. They help maintain grazing lands. That's inc incredibly important from a biodiversity perspective. That can be with native ruminants. We've actually worked to restore buffalo, our bison populations in the United States, to reintroduce them to uh, indigenous communities where they traditionally roamed. And that can be a hugely effective way of actually maintaining and protecting native grasslands. There's opportunities even at that individual ranch level for innovation and for change. We're working now on trying to be able to improve grazing management practices that in some cases have significant potential to sequester carbon, not everywhere, through things like virtual fencing and other technologies that allow farmers to manage in real time, adapt to weather, adapt to a, cha a changing climate. So these technologies are quite interesting and can empower and enable new uh, practices at the ranch level. But I think the earlier comment is not incorrect. We also live in a system where there are bottlenecks in the in industry and where there are single uh, industry actors or small groups of industry actors that have outsized power. I think some can view that and certainly many do as potentially a problem, but it also presents a unique scaling opportunity. And so we don't shy away from uh, working with some of these large companies that have a lot of market power because they actually have the ability to implement that scale. And I think that's really important because they also have the ability to invest at scale, which I know we're going to be talking about later. Awesome. Um, William, my, my question for you is um, how much investment is needed, particularly in the livestock sector, to make this transition to net zero? And I think that's the, the question that and the answer that everybody's expecting today. Where is the money coming from? Yeah, it's a, yeah, of course, everyone looks at the World Bank for where is the money coming from. <laughs> Um, and it's true. I mean, we, you know, frankly, we, we are the, the most significant provider of development financing for agriculture and food globally. In our uh, fiscal year 2023, we provided uh, $6 billion in new financing for agriculture and, and food in developing countries. About half of that, or $3 billion, had climate co-benefits, either adaptation or, or mitigation or both. Um, but that's, you know, frankly, a drop in the bucket compared to what's needed. And in, in our um, Recipe for a Livable Planet report, we, we tackle this question head on. We estimate that, and we look at the entire agri-food system, though not just livestock. We estimate that in total we would need about um, $260 billion dollars in um, uh, climate finance annually, just on the mitigation side, to put us on track to achieving net zero in the agri-food system by 2050, which is what we need in order to, to achieve the, the Paris Agreement targets. It sounds like a lot of money, 260 billion, but when you compare that to the you know 650 billion plus that we spend every year on subsidies and other support for agriculture, it, you know, it's only maybe around a third of that. So one of the things, and, and you know, we don't talk about um, taking away public support for agriculture. I mean, we, we do believe in supporting farmers, and, and we see them as, as our main clients, I mean, beneficiaries. But we talk about repurposing those public supports, using them more effectively for investments that actually increase productivity and efficiency while reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing deforestation, and, and so on. And so we estimate that you know, of that $260 billion, at least $70 billion 
could come from existing, you know, public subsidies for agriculture without adversely affecting other objectives like, you know, productivity enhancements and so on. Let me cheer up to there, but do you think this is politically viable? Because reducing some subsidies to food production means it's going to be more expensive. Beef is going to cost more or should, uh, and that should, you know, make consumers angry. And yeah, I mean, that, so again, we're not talking about um, reducing or taking away subsidies. We're talking about repurposing them. So it would still, you know, go to agriculture, but it would go towards investments and, and you know, research and development, extension services in things that we actually need, like uh, addressing that question of, you know, how do we uh, reduce emissions from enteric fermentation and livestock? It's that there's a huge innovation gap there. That's in, in our, you know, in our research, that's the, of, of all of the kind of subsectors in agriculture, that is the biggest innovation gap we found. That's, that, that's the difference between, you know, the size of the emissions coming from that subsector and the cost effective mitigation right now. It, it, it's huge. There's very little cost effective mitigation that we can get from enteric fermentation reduction right now. But, what, you know, what, so what we're talking about is repurposing. A lot of the, the subsidies now, they're not actually, um, in, you know, improving food security or improving farmer livelihoods. They're going for things like fuel subsidies and fertilizer subsidies and water subsidies that, that cause people to use these resources inefficiently. They, they don't increase long-term productivity and they contribute to environmental problems. So, you know, repurpose those towards productivity, enhancing green types of investments and, and uh, you know, that would go a long way towards significantly increasing. Right now, just to add, you know, only 2% of global mitigation financing goes to the agri-food system, 2%, even though it's responsible for about a third of greenhouse gas emissions, it's a pittance. So we, we you know, we need to scale that up, but a significant chunk can come from repurposing the current public expenditures on, on agriculture. Thank you. Um, Michael, you've uh, emphasized the, the importance of um, working with big companies to drive climate action, even though many of them uh, face criticism for their environmental impact. Uh, can you explain why is it so important to involve these companies in this conversation? Yeah, happy to. I mean, first off, it's one of many means of driving change. Um, we need action by the private sector, but we absolutely and 100% need public policy reform that basically creates the market conditions in which market actors work. Um, but I would say uh, we, we have seen actually, and we're talking about, we heard the comment earlier about deforestation, there actually is a double-edged sword in a, in a, and potentially an upside sometimes to working with larger companies. And I'll give an example. In uh, the Amazon, where the single biggest driver of deforestation is in fact cattle, although it's complex, there's land speculation, there's clearing and forestry that happen before cattle come on the land and often soy can follow. Uh, so it's a complex system, but what we've seen actually is the biggest actors, the ones who are um, under the most pressure from investors who want to list publicly or who want to uh, basically attract capital from premier uh, markets, they've divested of their assets in the Amazon, which instead of shifting the pro basically leaving the problem with those who actually can be effectively pressured to change, both by activists and by investors and by the broader community, they've sold it off to small local operators who work under the radar. And you've actually seen the creation of effectively a, B mar a secondary market that doesn't have pressure, that's extremely hard to influence, and that in fact makes it an even more intractable problem to solve this. So I think there's, um, there, again, there's many views on this, Point, but I think in some cases it can actually be beneficial to have those large companies that are often facing criticism but have uh, responsibilities to their investors, to their boards, to the public, and are public facing in these difficult situations because that's where they can actually drive change. Uh, Charles, um, there's been a lot of talk and for a while now about those uh, solutions to reduce methane emissions. Uh, from the livestock sector, you know, we're talking about feed additives, vaccines, breeding. We've discussed some of those solutions here today. 
but uh, correct if I'm wrong, they don't seem to be advancing so fast in terms of implementation. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll like to hear from you what's the, the biggest barriers to implementing these solutions and how important is you know, funding in this process? I really love this question because the biggest barrier to implementation is having the solution first. Um, it's really hard to implement something you don't have. Um, and the reality is that we talk about these solutions, feed additives, vaccines, breeding. In order to breed animals for this, you need a breeding index. You don't have a breeding index for lamethane animals. You have to build one. Then you have to have, you have to actually breed for it. You have to select for it. Um, the, you know, the farmer has to make that decision in order to deploy a vaccine through whatever means necessary and uh, throughout the world, we have to actually get a proof of concept and manufacture a vaccine. We are years away from that, and we have not really seen that proof of concept developed out um, in, in, the, in the academic world. Um, feed additives have been you know, developed. We have proof of concept, right? We have it out. Bovera is available now here in the US. We get 30% applicability. We have to be very real with ourselves about the, uh, the reach of these solutions. We're able to access dairy farms, we're able to access maybe feedlots, uh, when it's approved for feedlots, you know what I mean? Um, and we also have to be real about the economic uh, uh, reality of, of those types of solutions, um, especially if they don't provide any type of uh, uh, producer benefit. So the first step to adoption is development. And we are not in an ecosystem that is drawing on development. We have not sent the right market signals to these innovators, to these private companies that says that we want these solutions. I've talked to, I will tell you, probably every startup in this space. Everyone. I, I hear chuckles because they know. Um, uh -huh. And you know, many that you know, many that you might not have even heard of. And the reality is when they go for, to investors and they talk to investors, they go to the end of the line and say, what's the biggest risk? Ah, regulatory first. How do I get it to market? then it's the market. It's hard to invest in something where there's not a clear side line of sight to a market. There's an enormous buyer uncertainty in these technologies. We have not sent those market signals to these innovators, to develop those technologies. And we need to be putting that value, placing that value on the solutions that we need. And that is pasture-based systems, things that are cheap enough and efficacious enough to make the impact necessary. And if we can set that product, product profile, and we can draw the right market signals, we will get development, and we have to be there. And do you think for us to be able to send those market signals, to create those market signals, we need to, to, to work you know, through regulation or? Well, <laughs> there, I mean, there, there's really two ways to make a market pull. You can avoid costs or um, uh, avoid future costs. Um, and you know, uh, policy is one mechanism yeah, that can be deployed for, uh, to put a signal for avoiding costs. And then there's the voluntary market, right? There's the voluntary pull for producers to want to come in and put their money where their mouth is. The problem is, is there's a lot of commitment out there. We've seen a lot of companies say, if you build it, we will buy it. But it's not there, right? The, we have a misplace, uh, misplacement of capital. And in the, in the methane space in general, for livestock methane, um, it's really been aggregated together. We talk about manure methane, we talk about enteric methane. And when you're talking about something you can do today, that's not enteric methane, that's manure methane. And so we continue to invest capital into something that has less than a third of the greenhouse gas emissions. And manure methane is 8% of the US greenhouse gas budget, or methane budget, excuse me. Enteric methane is 27%. We're at 200x the amount of investment in manure methane than we are enteric. We need to start addressing the hard problems um, and not just going for the low-hanging fruit. We need to be banging our head against the hard problems. And that's going to take significant capital. And that, that's going to mean having companies, if this is a voluntary agreement, come to the table and say, I'm willing to pay this amount. Here it is. If it looks like this, I will buy it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Jeanette, uh, why must gender equality must be taken into consideration when we talk about financing sustainable livestock systems. Uh, how are those two things connected, and, uh, and, and why is it an issue that we should be paying attention to? 
Well, thanks for the question. And, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to answer that because I think to, and obviously I'm kind of the odd person out for more reasons than one on this panel, not just because of my gender, but I'm in a different type of farmer and a different way of thinking about this. But um, gender is something that is surprisingly to me and shockingly overlooked in the livestock sector. Um, I, I, I'm a forester by training. I understand there's professional biases, um, but I don't get it because I still think that farmers are women, so many of them, and they have livestock. So we need to be aware of what are women farmers' realities. And the realities for women farmers are very different than that of men. They don't own land. They don't have access to finance. They don't have access to education. Um, there's discrimination. Um, they don't get to participate in decision-making opportunity. So all of that affects their abilities to deal with climate change and to deal with adaptation. And I think this is why it's absolutely critical that we think about this group of farmers and, and pay attention to it. And you had 2%, I'm going to beat you on this one. Um, one less than 1% 1 of all climate finance has anything to do with gender. And of that, a pittance, not even a 0.1%, goes down to the grassroots level and to farmers to help them. So something's really wrong with this problem. But there's increasingly now, I've been in meetings this week with gender and climate finance people, um, both from the gender investment side and from the climate finance side. And there's an understanding now, this is a risk to our system. This affects the effectiveness of our, whether they're mitigation or adaptation projects. If we can't get the benefits and engage the people who are most affected by this problem. We've got real problems from the finance perspective as well. Do you think policymakers and other st stakeholders are starting to listen on the risks of uh, now? I mean, I, I, well, we don't have time for it, but I, I, <laughs> I think there's opportunities in carbon markets. And this is where I'm out there. And many people in the gender world don't understand climate markets or, or carbon markets, but I think there's opportunities for women themselves to manage projects and manage activities that could be reducing carbon emissions. Why not? Why do we only see women as some beneficiary down the line? Why can't they be managing the projects? Um, and we have a standard, the W plus standard, that can be applied on top of a carbon standard, for example. So for a buyer or an investor, there's a way to pair the two. Um, and hopefully that will take off and we'll see how that goes. It's, it's an uphill battle, no question. Um. Question for all of you, since we were talking about who is going to fund this transaction, do you think that consumers are willing to participate in it? They're willing to pay a premium uh, on more sustainable products or willing to accept higher prices uh, that reflect the carbon impact of, of the products they're consuming? If you want to start. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I, I think it depends on the the, the, the country. I mean, the, in terms of the level of awareness and concern about um, the climate challenge. Um, so part of it um, requires education of, of consumers, I think, that has to come first um, before you, you can start expecting them to pay more for something. But I, I do think it is, you know, different examples have shown um, that consumer behavior can be change through education and, and other means. Um, but it, I, I don't know that that's the easiest or most, I think there are other more cost effective and, and faster ways to potentially address the problem. Can I have any thoughts on it? I think, I mean, again, I keep, you know, I'm going to keep banging on the women issue here, but Women are the consumers of the world. I mean, that, that's by far. Not to say if you're a woman, you necessarily are ready to pay for things. But I think consumers need to see where the added premium price they're paying is actually making a difference. And that's where I think we need to do measurement. And we need, we need to track what does it mean to pay an extra price? What is that price? What does that extra fund go for? And I think if we could show that it produced results down at the farmer level, it's worth a try. I'm going to be a little bit more pessimistic on the um, You're welcome on the, to on the market adoption side here. Uh, as far as making making a claim on a product in the market pool, the willingness to pay doesn't seem to be very attractive based on a, a lot of studies. Not not in the retail space. 
um, maybe in a, a, a where there's very, very high margins in some areas of, 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 the, of the economy, you'll be able to do that, but, but not, on, not on a retail shelf, um, not, in, not in production food systems. Um, and the reality is it's going to be a, it's going to be a race to the lowest possible, uh, reductions necessary in order to make a claim, right? The, the reality is if I'm going to, if I'm willing to pay one cent for a 10% reduction, am I willing to pay eight cents for an 80% reduction or does it mean nothing to me that it's not scaling? And I don't believe that the willingness to pay on a per price product, we can, we can increase it. Right, we can increase a, a penny, penny a liter of milk, and we can pay for these products um, to, to, to be adopted. And I think it, the market would absorb it just fine. But the reality is, is trying to market them at, as the driver for those emissions isn't a strong enough pay. So. I'm maybe not quite as pessimistic as Charles, but okay. I, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that when informed about the attributes of a product or a diet choice or other things that people will make better decisions. There's also a lot of misleading labeling. There's a profusion of labels. There's a profusion of, of different uh, claims, some of which are more credible than others. We're starting to see the market crack down on that in a way that has, a, I think, a positive effect insofar as it um, creates clarity and creates more trust in terms of knowing when one product has a better say, climate performance than another, or it's more healthier, et cetera. But it also uh, raises the stakes for those who want to make a claim because they run the risk of lawsuits and they run the risk of you know, what we're seeing of green hushing, where companies and others are still actually making strides on these issues but are less willing to talk about it because they're afraid of a lawsuit or of, a, of other negative press. So I think, I mean, I think the willingness to pay is pretty low but I do think we have a lot of room to go in terms of actually better communicating both the health side of dietary choices and the environmental side of it. Okay. Uh, we need to uh, wrap this up, but a last one for all of you. Uh, given the scale of the challenges, um, how optimistic you are from one to 10 that we're gonna get there, and gonna get the, the job done by 2050. By 2055. Yeah, in the lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think I think we can get. That. I would say an eight. Eight. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. that's good. I'm not going to go all the way to ten. But. Okay. Get it. I'm an optimist by nature, so I'm not. I'm sure I'm but um, above a five. But I really don't spend any time thinking about it. I just keep plowing forward with trying to support the solution. I don't know. <laughs> You're the pessimist. No, I'm going to go with the ten, and the reason is um, you don't have a lot of choice. And if you give yourself room for failure, do you have the opportunity for failure? Um, and so, if we if we make it a binary decision that we will either do it or we will not, um, the we have a higher probability of making it happen. So I'm going to go with ten. I'm going to split the difference and say a nine. <laughs> I'm a scientist by training, so it's really hard to be that confident. But uh, I, it's an imperative. And you know, I've been here for three days, and I've met um, hundreds of people who are working day in and day out. They get up in the morning, and they go to bed at night thinking about these issues, and they're all really smart. We also face massive challenges, whether it's mis misplaced subsidies, whether it's our inability to put a price on carbon, whether it's the transaction costs of trying to change behavior on millions of farms. Um, but we got to try. All right. OK, I think we have some, some time for questions from the audience. No? OK, Mike says we are out of time, so. <laughs> so only one question, the gentleman. On my left side. Um, thank you, panel. Um, my name is Varun, and um, I want to just um, present some points. So, according to the CDC, three out of four 
um, infectious uh, diseases come from um, raising farm animals. The panel has talked about increasing meat consumption in developing countries. This comes with the risk of pandemic and antimicrobial resistance. Evidence suggests that the consumption of meat is lower per capita in the countries in the global south compared to countries in the west. Wouldn't it be beneficial um, supporting and investing in their traditional foods that don't involve farm animals rather than expanding farming of animals given the risk that comes with it, not only in terms of methane emissions, land use change, and biodiversity loss, but also you know, pandemics? Wouldn't it also be a form of um, neo-colonialism to expand Western-style food systems centered on meat consumption to developing countries, especially when it comes with loss of negative consequences? Thank you very much. Want to take just one? I can start. I think in the first, first part, I mean, absolutely, 100%, we need to invest outside of the handful of staple crops that feed the world and are increasingly susceptible to climate change impacts and to pests, disease, resistance, things like this. So absolutely, we need to be investing in the diverse, diverse cropping systems. I mean, that's 100% part of the solution. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll just say that, you know, uh, as far as antibiotic resistance is concerned, um, it, it comes down to stewardship and proper animal management at the end of the day, uh, whether or not you're using antibiotics properly, um, for their actual intended use, but also when you talk about infectious diseases, one of the large drivers of mortality of infectious diseases is the lack of nutrition as well. And so making sure that we have access to proper food, whether that's an animal product or not, um, really is, is, is a major driver there. Um, but yes, there's, there's a, lot for, a lot of room for opportunity. There's also a lot of room for us to learn in the development of those systems from what we've done um, in the developed world and to deploy those systems in management and screenings for animal uh, uh, antibiotic resistance organisms in, uh, in the wild. So. I appreciate that. Um, I think this ends our session. Um, thank you. Thank you all for your participation. I'm going to hand it back to Shirley. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gerson, and thanks to our panel. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to try and summarize anything of these rich discussions. Um, but in order for that to happen, I'm going to hand over to Simon O'Connell, who's the CEO of SNV. Simon. Thank, thank you very much, Shirley. And I can, I can see everyone's kind of getting itchy or eager to have a a drink, so I've, I'm, I'm going to be as brief as I can, and I've scribbled down um, a bunch of notes in my little booklet here, so let me, um, let me give it a go. Um, I think maybe the first thing I, I, I would like to say, um, there's a bit of tension in the room. I think you can feel it, and, and frankly, I think that's quite, quite good. A lot of the discussions I've been in over the last uh, few days um, you know, perhaps there's there's a bit too much of the platitudes or the nodding or the agreeing, and and something. You know, this is a a mega mega complicated topic, and I think it's healthy to bring some of the some of the tensions into the room. I loved love love what you said um, over there around the need for some nuance. Just real top line, and this isn't an SMV plug, but this is to kind of highlight some of the complexities. We're working um, on very very large scale resilience building initiatives across Mali. Niger and Burkina Faso with, of course, dozens and dozens of partners. And the vast majority of the populations there are, are agro-pastoralists, and we're looking for livelihood diversification opportunities. But those are extraordinarily complicated environments. We're working with 130,000 dairy farmers in Ethiopia and, and have seen milk yields go from 4 to 16 or 18 liters per day. In Uganda, we've got a million kids, again, with loads of partners, um, having better access to dairy nutri nutrition products in, in schools. If anyone's got other ideas around what we can do better, we've done a million biodigesters globally. We think those are necessary and important. They're part of solutions to the immensity of the problems that we're grappling with. So I just wanted to kind of highlight um, some of the some of the things that we're doing and some of the complexities. S second point, um, yeah, 
Absolutely, it's nuanced and part of you know navigating the nuance or understanding things better. What we've heard a lot of is is context matters. Of course, the the gender point, you know, smallholder farmers, the vast majority are women. So we need to put you know gender centric uh, approaches absolutely front and center of what we're doing. We've heard food waste is a topic here in our wealthy, more affluent Western or Northern societies. Food waste, let's not lose sight of that. Let's think it's very easy to think when we hear the word, well, we need better education. So that's what educating smallholder farmers in northern Mali or Somali region of Ethiopia, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's about educating populations here in the Big Apple in the city of New York, where we've got all these food waste issues going on. And it's, of course, about paying, um, where's the gentleman, paying, uh, paying true cost, paying fair price, yeah? In, in, in our more affluent societies. Over here we heard, and there was wonderful kind of science and data at the, bin, uh, at the, at the beginning, we heard about there are indeed some solutions and we all need to avoid the sort of um, solution looking for a problem approach, right? We all need to ensure that the solutions are tailored to context, but we had better genetics, better feeding, um, digital tools, actually, we didn't hear that much about the sort of digital tools side, but there are, of course, many opportunities around that, and of course, better policy frameworks. We heard a bit about the sort of systems approach and the interconnection around your kind of food systems, your energy nexus areas and other things, but a more systemic approach is of course what's needed. And then just one more point, you know, we all recognize that we need to move at further speed, faster speed and at greater, a greater scale. So there's a bit coming through perhaps on the financing side, a bit with the DFIs, with MDB, World Bank, perhaps, you know, accelerating some financing, but we know more needs to be done there. We know more needs to be done around bringing down the costs of information, that precious access to information piece, and that's where the, the technologies um, can come in. And then back to the last point again, you know, financing, frankly, the more wealthy amongst us need to pay a fairer price and absorb more of the costs around accelerating towards bigger scale solutions. Yeah. So that's my kind of top line takeaway. I'm sure there's going to be some heated discussion over some drinks in a minute, but thank you and thank you for hosting very much.